good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Dorothy Meal. I'm Head of College of Humanities and Social Science, and I want to extend a really warm welcome to everyone who's here. We've got a number of people who've travelled over from um, uh, Amsterdam and the Netherlands. Uh, very good to see you. We've also got people all the way from Glasgow, which is perhaps even more impressive. Um, <laughs> And uh, I know that we have in the audience a number of uh, Betty Lou's colleagues, friends, family. Very nice to see family. Um, students, former students, and I know there are some members of the public and colleagues from around the college and the university here. So a warm welcome to all of you. Just to say also that we are recording the talk and it will be like all our inaugurals uh, on the university website shortly, which will mean that those who couldn't manage to come over will be able to access it and see it later. Um, we'll be having a reception after the lecture, and you're all very, very welcome to join us just next door for some wine and nibbles and a chance to talk more informally with Betty Lou. So I'm delighted to be welcoming uh, Professor Betty Lou Loss, who's our university new Forbes Chair of English Literature. Oh, sorry, English language. <laughs> I know that's a big boo-boo, I'm really sorry. <laughs> totally different school. Um, I, I know that many of you will know Professor Loss very, very well, but I just wanted to take a few minutes to sketch out a little bit of her previous career before joining us here at Edinburgh um, for those who perhaps know her a little less well. So Betty Lou was born in Amsterdam and studied for her first degree in English language and literature at the University of Amsterdam. While she was there, she also took extra courses in Old Icelandic and in Middle Welsh at the University of Utrecht. Then, after a year studying and teaching at Bangor University on a Harting scholarship, she went back to Amsterdam to do an MA in English language and literature. Now, like many of her cohort of graduates at the time, and to an extent like a lot of graduates now, breaking into a full-time academic career was very difficult after her MA, and she existed on a series of short-term teaching contracts at the University of Amsterdam before being lucky enough to secure a post while studying for her PhD at the Free University in Amsterdam. I know she's still very grateful for the support she had in securing this opportunity from Olga Fischer and Svan Kemenante, and Geert Voich. And it's wonderful that Anne's in particular can be here to join us this evening and to help celebrate with, with Betty Lou. After completing the PhD in a postdoctoral position, Betty Lou was appointed to a lectureship at the Free University of Amsterdam in 2004, and shortly after secured a lectureship at Radboud University in Nijmegen, becoming senior lecturer in 2008. So then she was appointed to the Forbes Chair of English Language here and joined us last year. Betty Lou's research focuses on the history of English, historical syntax, early Germanic, Old English, and the information structure and discourse structure of historical texts. And she's been hugely successful in her work in these areas over her career so far. She had an influential monograph, has co-authored books and chapters and edited texts, and with Anne van Kemenade, won a large-scale grant from the Netherlands Organisation for Scientific Research to study syntax and information structure, which ran for four years from 2009. So now I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Betty Lou Loss to present her inaugural lecture, examining the ways in which the English language has evolved over many years and entitled Changing English. Um, I've um, uh, chosen Changing English, of course, because it's, uh, it's, it's, I hope the title is clear that I'm going to talk about uh, things that happened to English. Um, one of the things that people might expect me to talk about uh, when I'm talking about Changing English is that I'm maybe going to talk about, um, uh, I'm maybe going to fulminate against uh, sloppy, the sloppy talk of the, the, the young people today or loss of standards. Uh, I don't think that people will be very likely to think I'm going to talk about how wonderful all these new, new changes are. And I'll, I'm going to devote the first part of my talk to uh, possible reasons for why, as speakers, we are all so conservative and we are resistant to change and uh, we worry about correctness and stuff like that. Um, in a way, 
language is a cultural artifact. We learn language, um, and there are some resemblances to, uh, to clothing, to fashion. For, uh, for a start, like clothes or hairstyles, um, it's part of our appearance. The language to speak defines us. It uh, makes a statement about our identity, about how we like to appear. And our appearance is a bit of a shortcut for people to make snap judgments about us. And, um, of course, it's true that clothing is important. Clothes make the man or woman. And we can actually verify our judgments on clothing when we look at portraits of our forebears, we see they are clothed differently, they have different hairstyles, and we know that underneath they're just like us. And we know that the clothing changes every couple of years uh, or so. We know that in 30 years' time, standards will be very different with respect to clothing, but even uh, 10 years from now or next year, things will be very different. And somehow we don't have that same feeling about language. Somehow we want language to stay stable and we want people to talk exactly as we talk. Um, why is this? There is a, um, uh, I've got the slide with a quote uh, from uh, George Bernard Shaw. It's a very famous quote. Usually what you get is the, the grey area uh, without any context. And I was confronted with this particular quote a long time before I knew what the, the text that it was taken from. It's impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without making some other Englishman hate or despise him. When I first saw this quote, I thought that maybe George Bernard Shaw was a very enlightened person, that he somehow managed to go against his natural conservatism in language and had sort of uh, uh, reservations about correctness in language. But when I saw it in the context of the preface to Pygmalion that is, this has been taken from, it turns out that really he is not. He is all for correctness. He wants to encourage people to talk to prestigious lects, have the prestigious accent. And what he really um, uh, uh, wants to uh, uh, address is the fact that spelling, English spelling, is not really helping people who want to uh, um, uh, perfect their, their accent. This is, you may be familiar with this spelling uh, of fish that he invented. He says, well, if GH in enough can be F, there we have F. If O in women can be I, there we have I. And if TI in station can be SH, there we have SH. So this is fish. Uh, of course, English spelling uh, has its drawbacks. It hasn't really changed since the 13th century. And uh, lots of sound changes have happened since. The spelling has not really been updated, and that causes all sorts of difficulties. But even if the spelling uh, was updated as often as, for instance, Dutch or German spelling is updated, and I think we probably update it in a major way every generation in the Netherlands and in Germany, even then you could not expect the spelling to give people um, a clue to the, the exact uh, pronunciation of the prestigious lex. The, the whole thing is far too subtle to be captured in spelling. So, um, moving on, something that really brings home the subtlety of an accent, so particularly accent phonology, is um, uh, the search for the perfect bilingual. Now, um, Vincent van Heuven, Charlotte de Gooskens, and Nee van Bezooye were looking for a perfect bilingual Dutch-German because they were going to conduct a study to um, see what the linguistic factors were behind the well-known fact that Dutch speakers have um, not as much trouble understanding German speakers and vice versa. German speakers have a lot more trouble understanding Dutch speakers. There are all sorts of other there's things like familiarity with the accent and Dutch speakers hear more German than Germans hear Dutch, etc. But uh, they thought there might also be linguistic factors and they wanted to uh, do a proper study about it. They needed one speaker who was completely perfect in both Dutch and German. Not just grammar or morphology, but particularly accent. They had, um, they had a search, they had various candidates... They had two panels, one panel of uh, Dutch speakers, Dutch native speakers, another panel of 49 German speakers. These panelists were not trained phoneticians. They were ordinary people. And this is important for what I'm going to say. 
speaker after speaker, supposedly perfectly bilingual, were presented to these panels. And speaker after speaker was rejected. Panel panelists said, no, that's not a native Dutch speaker. No, it's not a native German speaker. And it took about six months for them to, to find somebody who stood the test. Um, there was only one German, and there were only five Dutch panelists who judged her speak, speech to be non-native. And they said, well, this is below chance level, so here we have our perfect <laughs> bilingual. What is it that makes non politicians so good at um, identifying actions that are not their own to identify people speaking another lect? Um, in a way, the way to think about it, I think the key ingredient, <coughs> if you look at is speaker's records, where she's been, she's been in and out of the Netherlands and Germany and Switzerland from her earliest childhood. She's been to kindergarten in both countries, she's been to primary school in both countries, she's been to secondary school in both countries, she studied in, at universities in both countries, and she had jobs in both countries. So she was up and down all the time. And the key thing is childhood. She was up and down from an early age, and this probably was the um, reason that her accent in both German and Dutch was so perfect. And I think that it's probably, uh, it probably must have provided at some stage an, an evolutionary advantage. If it's so difficult to acquire a perfect accent, if you have to be sort of a childhood member of your tribe for you to become perfect, so that other people cannot um, identify you as an outsider, this will give you a snap judgment to see whether somebody to hear, whether somebody is really is sort of us or them. Does, do they belong to your group or do they belong to another group? So for knowledge is a very powerful predictor and very powerful mechanism for snap judgments. And this is probably what um, makes us have this sort of gut feeling when we hear people speak uh, uh, a lack that's not really our own. Uh, this is a famous study by uh, the famous linguist uh, Bill Leboff. Here's our study in New York. New York had um, a variety of American English which ha did not have, did not pronounce R's after vowels, so called post vocalic R. And you may maybe remember uh, the character Charlie Bunker from All in the Family and his pronunciation of the word first, foist. Right? There was no R there. There's something else there, but no R. And at one stage, this was, uh, this was, uh, this was, this was very much um, uh, identified as the, as the local, the regional lex of New York. But there are, but people were, um, uh, they knew that actually this was not, uh, this was local and this was not standard American. They knew that standard American was doing something else, that standard American pronounced their R's in those positions. And when Lord Boff did his study, he had people, he recorded people in various styles. He had them in only conversation, but he also had them reading word lists and he had them um, uh, reading isolated words. And of course, the more uh, uh, formal the styles were, the more they were monitoring their own pronunciation and the more they were really showing the sort of pronunciation they wanted to come out with. And this is how you find out that all of these classes Right, this, sort of, this was, these people were divided uh, as to class here. All of the classes pronounced more R's in the more formal style. So as soon as they started to read out lists or text or isolated words, these are all the broken lines the for more formal style, they're, they're, the rates of R, R's go up. And the really interesting group is the, what the, the group which is, the, this is the, the nine group, it must be the upper class. There's probably the model because usually the prestigious elect is what the economically powerful people speak. And um, very interesting is this slot. They are sort of just below class nine, and apparently they want to imitate class nine so much, it's really their model, they're overshooting the mark. They're, having, they're putting in more R's than their model. And this was a famous study, it really brought home. You could actually, um, uh, you could actually catch a sound change red-handed if you went if you went about it the right way. You could see what people were doing, you could see how they were monitoring themselves and how they were trying to uh, acquire another lect as if they were donning uh, a power suit. Right? So this really this is the, the close metaphor again. 
It also shows that sounds and certain variables can acquire social values that, they can be, that people can sort of try to acquire them for social reasons. And this is particularly interesting if it's um, about sounds, again, because evolutionary, we're, we're such well-trained phoneticians, really. We're sort of we're natural phoneticians. We can, we can hear these things. So it's important that people, if want, if people want to appear, uh, we want to alter their appearance also in speech, that they go for, for this, um, they can consciously uh, try to, uh, to go for a model. And uh, this is probably also a very powerful mechanism for language change, that you have um, sizable groups in the population who, who overshoot their mark, who hypercorrect. However, it's not just accent that has variables and social values. Uh, again, going back to Pygmalion, George Bernard Shaw's play, and later My Fair Lady, the film, uh, at one stage, Eliza has been um, very carefully coached by Professor Higgins. Her accent is completely perfect, and she's introduced in polite society. But Higgins hasn't realized that it's not just her accent that's, that, that's the trick. Um, poor Eliza is um, uh, sort of tripped up by the fact that she, the, the topics she selects as suitable for polite conversation are not the ones that are fashionable in these circles that she's now moving in. Uh, her morphology is off. She has, uh, oh, where you go? I want to do this. Right. She has different tenses or maybe different forms of the irregular verbs. She has uh, a different form for the subject pronoun. She has a different form for the relative pronoun. Uh, and altogether, uh, her lexicon is not that the one, the one that's of the, the class that uh, she might want to aspire to. Right? So, done her in, then pinched it, so pinched and done her in, really mark her also as not belonging to this particular group. So, it's not just phonology. There are these other levels of linguistic, linguistic description where we can find these variables and where, of course, we can find change. And... Uh, one way of looking at this is that you have sounds. They are building blocks uh, for larger units, morphemes. Uh, morphemes, in turn, are building blocks for larger units, words. And then you have syntax, where words are strung together, I would say, first as phrases and then as sentences. And um, of all of these levels, as you go down from sounds to morphemes to words, it becomes more difficult to give them a social value. Sounds are really fairly meaningless. They're strung together as a convention. There's no particular reason why this is called floor or this is called screen. You simply hit on that word to communicate. There could just as well be other words. There's nothing intrinsically in words like floor or screen, that particular string of sounds that, that, that uh, uh, dictates that these meanings should be uh, attached to these strings of, of phonemes. And that means there's lots of uh, scope for variation and change because you don't need to stick to that particular word screen. You can actually make it screen if you want to, if there's a, if there's a fashionable person who uh, changes their, uh, their pronunciation, that's fine, and then other people could actually model, could actually uh, take them as their model and, um, and follow them. Um, as you go down, you, get, you really get sort of less of that and you get sort of more meaningfulness. And it also gets more difficult for the linguist, not just the linguist, but also the speaker, to identify variables. So for New Yorkers, you had R or not R. So that was a clear opposition between, between two variables. This is more in a way of more for syntax. Uh, the first one is from Lark Rice to Candleford, Flora Thompson, 19th century, where uh, this is a more geographical variation where people have nor, where the standard might have than. We have a similar sort of geographical but also class-based variation in Dutch with the same thing. I'm putting in some Dutch uh, examples for my audience because there's loads of people from the Netherlands. And, Later on, I have a better excuse to, uh, to, to use Dutch. So I have a very flimsy excuse here, but uh, it's actually the same sort of thing when you have, you have than or you have as, and it's um, uh, people can at one stage people made judgments about people using as as opposed to than, and I think it's, it's sort of it's starting to be um, more accepted that people have to sort of the more 
um, marked variant as. In uh, turning back to English, there's a very lovely study about this particular thing, definite article, um, definite article reduction, and this is a Yorkshire feature, and it's not just the case that people always model themselves on the economically powerful, right? It's not just, we don't all work as the New, New York study. It is also possible to don this suit of clothes as a badge of identity, and if this sort of thing is very, is, is, is very peculiar to, to Yorkshire, and you really want to sort of uh, uh, I don't know, beam out the message that you're from Yorkshire, you could, you could up your uh, degree of definite article reduction. And this particular study shows that there's lots of people are doing. So it's not just, presti well, prestigious has a number of different meanings. It's also about identity and it's who you want to belong to, really. If you go to syntax, and now he's entering my particular uh, arena, um, things get even more difficult because you have to identify which bits are the variables, uh, which bits are in competition. It's no longer a case of having post vocalic R or having something else. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about a finite clause and we're talking about a non-finite clause, a two-infinitive. And in um, this particular work of mine, the problem was, well, are these two variants of the same thing? And you could, there's a number of things that uh, happen. You find that it's a set of the same verb, and here we have nudam, which is Old English for urge. Um, the set of the same verbs can be followed by the two complements. And you might think, well, this particular complement is a full clause. It has a, per, it has a position for a subject. It also has a finite verb, which is tensed. And you might think that gives it an edge uh, in terms of communication over this other thing, which does not have a position for a subject and is a non-finite form, an infinitive, so it's not tense marked. Um, and you might think, well, they cannot be in competition because there's a meaning difference. But in effect, if you think about it, this they, right, this word he, always has to be the same people as the object of urge of them here. So you can always predict what you'll find here in these clauses. Similarly, the tense of this subjunctive verb will always be the same as the tense of this higher verb. So the items are completely predictable. And that means that actually the two infinitive and the subjunctive clause uh, can become variables of the same thing. And indeed, if you chart these structures over time in corpora, it's exactly what you find. You find that the two infinitive is encroaching on the domain of the subjunctive clause. So much so that uh, for urge, we can probably still have uh, that clause in modern English, but there's loads of verbs verbs of meanings, of meanings of try or intent, where you can no longer have a that clause. I try that I finish my homework is not really what you would say today. You would say, I try to finish my homework. Right? So the, the two infinitive has won out. But the point is that it's very difficult to identify them as variables of the same thing. And it's also very diff difficult to find a social value attaching to any one of these. I've tried to find a social value in um, a study by uh, Anne van Linden, who, because uh, I just looked at verbs, and verbs followed by these structures, but Anne van Linden looked at adjectives. There are adjectives like good, or fitting, or suitable, or right, where you find the same thing. You find subjunctive clauses in Old English, and you find two infinitives, and she thought, well, maybe there's the same thing going on. And yes, she did find competition. She found the two infinitives upped, and subjunctive clauses down, and um, the two things were in competition in that particular environment as well. Uh, at one stage, there's a set of adjectives that do not join in the general trend towards two infinitives. And one is vital, another one is crucial, and there's also essential. Their um, rates of 
to infinity of tens, ten to lag. They still have plenty of finite clauses as their complement. And at one stage, I thought, or well, maybe it's the case that people, maybe sort of pompous politicians, like to have that clause because it sort of it sort of it adds this this formality to their statements. And some of these, this particular, it's vital that the vaccine is introduced. You could say it's vital to introduce the vaccine. So you might think, well, as soon as you've got some sort of generic subject, you could have a two infinitive. And why would you have a that clause if you can have a two infinitive? <laughs> But if you look at corporate, there's very, very few of these items. Often it's just the case that, that the speakers really want that subject. They, that subject is very salient. It's not a generic subject at all. So there are other reasons why these particular um, adjectives are lagging behind and probably will, will not uh, have two infinitives take over that clauses at all. So, it's, so I thought I'd found some sort of a social marker in syntax, but as it turned out, I didn't. Something else where uh, social marking, social values, is very difficult to, um, uh, to detect is word order. And word order is always a, a very sort of a funny business. This is something that really flies below the radar. Speakers are usually very uh, doing these things very automatically. Word order is all about giving your hearer a clue of what's coming next. Um, it's also easier for the speaker if there's sort of ready-made routines you can fall into. Then you don't have to think about how you're going to line these words up. So the, and there's all sorts of things to do with uh, accommodating your hearer. That you, you start with the stuff they already know. You want to end on the stuff they don't know. The point of your sentence. Um, anything you hear last is bound to make, make uh, uh, more of an impression on you. It stays in your memory longer. So there's all sorts of things that mediate against word order just becoming sort of in free variation and, and having social values attached to them. I am, I've given here word order in Dutch with English words, and the idea is that the Dutch speakers in the audience can check that what I'm going to say is actually what they themselves do intuitively with their language but I'm also giving some sort of commentary of what they're doing. And this, they might actually hear this for the very first time. Because speakers normally, that's the whole beauty of language. You've completely internalized all these levels. You are not aware of exactly what you're doing when you're lining all these words up. Later on, I'm going to talk about Old English. And there's a couple of things that Old English does the same as Dutch and German. And a couple of things they do differently. So actually, I have, I'm using Dutch legitimately here. Um, People might recognize these words as coming from a famous children's book in Dutch, a Donker uh, letter to the, for the king. The idea is that uh, if you want to make a, uh, a subclause in Dutch, what you usually do, and I haven't, uh, on purpose, I have not really labeled these slots other than just numbers, but uh, three would be a typical slot for subjects, four would be for adverbials, five would be for direct objects or any uh, complements of the verb, and then the whole thing would close off with the verb. So you could say that Dutch is a... There, there are reasons for saying that Dutch is a verb final language. For your subclause, you're basically okay. You don't really have to do anything else. You can do something else if you think, well, it really takes a long time for my poor hearer to wait for this verb to come around. And all the time my hearer has to keep all these bits in memory before they can be resolved by my verb. I mean, know what relationship all these bits have together. So it's, for many verb final languages, it's actually possible to detach bits uh, of, of particularly this slot and move them to the end. Then you, sort of, you have your verb come earlier, you can sort out the various roles, who's doing what to whom, and you've got, and you might want this actually in final place because it's your point of the sentence, it's your new information, then you would have, you would sort of really have, um, you would have killed two birds with one stone. So this too is a possible uh, subclause. You just have to put that in front of it and you're, you're done. If you want to build a main clause, you have to do a bit more. You start the same thing. Suppose you want to have that subclause and then you're building it into a main clause. Um, we have added main clause bits. Again, we've, we're putting uh, we in the subject slot, we have an adverbial, we have a verb, we put that here, we have this enormous thing in the five slot. We could put that uh, right to the back. 
Uh, still not done because the finite verb, and this is the whole thing about main clauses in Dutch, there's a symmetry between main clauses and sub clauses. For main clauses, you have to do a bit more. You have to move your finite verb to the second position. And I will, in a minute, uh, suggest a possible origin for this really peculiar phenomenon. You're not done yet. Uh, you've got your finite verb in slot two, and then you have to pick out any constituent from your clause and put it in the first slot and I've here picked then. So then you've got your clause. I'm doing the same for something where you've got loads of adverbials where you can just, you can shove a bit to the end. Uh, you put your finite verb in the second slot again. This is really verb second. It's the second slot for your finite verb. And you put uh, any sort of adverbial in the beginning, it really depends what you want to start with. And there are various reasons why you want, might want to start with the one or the other. The uh, symmetry between main clause and sub clause is extremely regular in Dutch, but when we go to Old English, things are not as regular. And the, they're extremely, they're very nice complexities to the Old English situation, which um, might give us some sort of scenario of why this sort of thing happened in the first place. When we look, and again, I have transliterated Old English here. I've used present-day English words, but I've given them uh, Old English word order. Uh, so we, here we have a, um, a question word in the first position. Again, finite verb, second slot. And here have some sort of negation for position, finite verb, second slot. And then we have subject and whatever is following. So it seems to be, on the face of it, this is just like we used from Dutch and German, where you find your finite verb in the second slot in the main clause. But, okay, we can do it, we can actually put something else there, we can have an adverbial, and it still seems much the same. Right, yeah. Again, we have a finite verb in the second slot, we have a subject following. And then we get a difference. You don't get this... Uh, with these items, but as soon as you have something else, not a question word, not negation, in the first position, what you'll find is that your verb can be far lower down. It's not in the second slot. Uh, it's actually in, well, let's, I've got it here, the fourth slot. The trick is, and this was, um, uh, we, we, people at first thought, well, Old English is not verb second. It is not like Dutch and German. Of course, that's true. But it doesn't mean that anything goes. It's particularly Ans van Kemenade who has discovered the systematicity behind this. The trick is that as soon as you're with this, these sorts of first constituents, if you've got phenomenal subjects, you will get that low verb. And that probably means that this one is actually, and this one is actually more like this. So we have a, a split. You've got these items, and they don't really care whether the subject is a pronoun or something else, and you have these items, they're adverbials, at least they're, they're not question words, they're not negation, and they have this difference. So you have the verb low down, pronouns come before, and longer bits, NPs, come behind. It's not fail-safe. There are also loads of occasion in uh, uh, Old English where in main clauses verbs don't, don't seem to do anything. They just stay put in final position. Um, it's, it's, even this is not completely fail-safe. It's not 100 percent, but it's, it's enough for um, a definite trend. What could be underlying this sort of system? How could a system like this arise? A possible reason could be something that has been observed for languages generally. If you have an asymmetry between subclauses and main clauses, if your subclauses do something different from your main clauses, it's usually the main clause that does the difficult thing. And if, if you go back in time, if you, if, if you have a language where you can go back in time, where you do have older text, um, your main clauses tend to be the ones that have innovated, have changed, and your subclauses tend to be the ones that have stayed the same. And the reason is that main clauses have to do a lot of things. They have to, they, 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 the first constituent has to 
either link up to what has come, gone before, some sort of discourse link. But if speakers want to, to highlight something, they also might want to put it in first position because it's so special. So the first position is really a continual battleground for different sort of constituents who want, who want, to, want to sit there. In a way, questions and negation call up alternatives. A question word is really like a variable. So loads of things can actually be filled in here. If you say what, you're really, there's a range of items. You're asking for the, I don't know, the identity of a range of items there. So you're, you're really evoking alternatives. If you have negation, a no evokes a yes. And something that might be underlying this particular phenomenon is focus, that maybe originally we had the finite verb move here to demarcate a domain for focus. And there are languages that use their finite verb in just such a way. They move it there to make a focus domain. Focus in present-day English still has something very similar. We still find finite verbs moving very close to the question words and to the negation. There is a difference in that it can only be auxiliaries that end up there. If there's not an auxiliary, do will come to the rescue. You'll get, you'll get do to uh, take that position. Uh, but otherwise, right, so it does. We have, ha we have auxiliary here, we have an auxiliary here. This is an interesting one. Under no circumstance, of course, that's sort of a, a negative uh, constituent. It does the same sort of thing. And here we have a focus marker only only in a certain case evokes not in all the other cases. So again, we have some sort of alternatives that, uh, that people are, made, are being made aware of. The interesting case is that for only, although you can have the same thing, so we have a, this only constituent, and then you have, again, we have do to the rescue. You have an alternative here. You could go for a cleft construction. And it's very interesting that while uh, English is really using a lot in, in, in the way of all this, this verb movement, in the way that Old English has it, when that's happening, the, this construction is new, and it's coming up at the same time that we're losing much of this. And I'm now giving a, a graph <coughs> that um, uh, is really due to the work of Erwin Komen, who's sitting there, who is a PhD in our project, and you can see that these, the clefts really sort of, they really start to take off round about this, this period. There were other types of cleft, but not this particular one. If you look at this only sentence, only then did I realize, you can pick out uh, constituents that have some sort of marker like only. In old English, it would be ana. And you can, we have the benefits of corpora, which are syntactically tagged so we can, and morphologically tagged. So it's, very, it's, it's, it's not that difficult to uh, see what all these various texts are doing in all these periods. And we really see a dramatic fall in focus markers in the first constituent. Right? And that's the ones, that's these ones. Right? We, fall, we, feel, we, feel, we see a fall in this lot. So you see a rise in this lot and a fall in this lot. So that might be a story for focus. Modern English still keeps it. We still have it it's sort of in a reduced form because we only really have auxiliaries uh, giving that particular clue. This lot, where you have something else in the first position and where you have this, this funny business with phenomenal subjects doing something different from non-phenomenal subjects, that's a different sort of story, I think. Um, when you're looking at this from the perspective of information, note that this adverbial is old information. It's a link to the previous discourse with them, meaning with those people. The people have been mentioned before, and now we're referring back to the people. And she, as a pronoun, is also old information. A maiden is new. So it might be that originally this lower position was a, a demarcation of old or given information versus new. These adverbials in first position 
the ones that contain demonstratives are uh, a funny lot in Old English, as they are in present-day Dutch and German. And I'm revering again back to Dutch and German. Um, with those, we need to feel, we need to be, you have to fill in people if you're translating this. There's a lot more scope for these demonstratives being used independently and referring back to specific items in the previous discourse. <coughs> in modern English, you cannot have that, the much of that, refer to people. Those referring to people is fine, but not that. We have after these words, and again we have a demonstrative here, it's, this is a link to the previous discourse. In that, a link to the previous discourse, we probably would have to say it had three vines, in it were three vines, in those were three vines, in that were three vines, that's quite difficult in modern English. Again, Bedam Avraz Moses, about those, and we have to add words, wrote Moses. So there's a lot more scope for these, for these demonstratives in earlier stages. Uh, it's not too difficult to just look at demonstratives and what they're doing as a first constituent. And we've done that for uh, slices of the historical corpora. For Old English, you find that demonstratives have, in first position, have quite a big slice of all the first constituents. And as you go to Middle English, that slice becomes smaller. And if you go to Modern English, that slice has become very small indeed. Demonstratives are not doing the same sort of job in Modern English as they did uh, in earlier times. Decline of adverbials in first position, so the adverbials that are linked to the previous discourse and have these demonstratives, you know, you'll find that English sentences, present-day English, tends to have subjects as their first constituents, much more than have, than have these adverbials with uh, discourse links. So there's a definite change here. There are changes in the form of demonstratives. In Old English, we have a full paradigm, and it's much like German today. We have genders, we have cases, we have number, we have singular and plural. And that all goes by in between sort of 1100 and 1200. Um, another interesting use and contrast between English on the one hand and Dutch and German on the other is this quote from uh, uh, an episode from uh, the series Columbo. And of course, Columbo is always on about his wife. No, my wife's not here. She had to go to Chicago to look after her mother. She had a fall and broke her hip. Woman at party. Your wife broke her hip? How terrible. No, her mother. This is quite difficult to uh, translate in Dutch without giving the game away. Because in Dutch, you would say, have a special form. You would have a demonstrative, D. You would not use a personal pronoun. The personal pronoun uh, gives the hearer the signal that you're still onto your previous topic, that you're really talking about the wife. But if you've introduced the mother here, and you want to talk about the mother, you shift by having a demonstrative. Old English is not quite like that. It's not as, Dutch is really coercing you. If you use the demonstrative, it has to be the mother. Old English is still free. There's a tendency to do it with demonstratives, to use them for topic shift. It's not, uh, it's not absolute. But it's another way in which demonstratives are doing other things. Um, I'm going to skip this for the most part. It's, it's, you might think, well, do we, we still have clause in this adverbs, and we do. But they tend to do different things. Many of the clause initial, particularly place adverbials, are really um, uh, evoking alternatives again. In Germany, the prospects are good. So in Germany, but not elsewhere. They're, look they're forward looking in a way. The prospects are good in Germany. It's not backward looking. Germany is not linking to previous discourse. It is still possible to, to have links to the previous discourse in first position, but if you go to corpora, they become vanishingly rare. And it's very interesting. It's still grammatical, but it's not used. People don't use it. Doing without these linking adverbials in English, uh, looking at translation handbooks, uh, translation handbooks always go on about these linking adverbials in Dutch, and daarom is really 
because of that, it's there is an R phenomenon, it's, for, it's really for your demonstrative. And the suggestion is that you should use a cleft in English. You might think, well, if they don't have these adverbial linkers anymore and they are using clefts instead, you might think, well, then the clefts must have been going up in the history of English. But actually, this type of cleft is not really very, it's not really on the rise at all. If you look at early modern English, it's not any sort of uh, big innovation that all of a sudden we find this is why or this is how. This one, also interesting, with this, and in English, they say, well, in English, try to go for a subject. You want to do your linking with the subject. You don't want to do it with an adverbial. And actually, when you think about it, if you want to contrast modern English with old English or with Dutch and German, one thing that's very different is that modern English has permissive subjects. Anything can be a subject. <coughs> this, I really like this one. The roof of the tunnel is seeping water. I can't really get this in Dutch. I would say door, I would say through the roof of the tunnel. Uh, we have a time at Fairview, 2004 saw something. This one is another uh, wonderful construction. We have something like it in Dutch with uh, verbs like roll. Somebody can roll a ball, the ball can roll. But English has really gone all out with these sort of manner of motion verbs. The car nosed into the city traffic. You've got loads of verbs where you have these, these, these alternative argument structures. You can have them transitive, so you have a, uh, an animate agent and the car will be direct object, and this will be a transitive verb, and you can have the same verb in the same meaning, but the car will be a subject. And that's, there's loads of these, uh, these pairs in English. This is a similar case. The matching hood, which is the subject, it converts into color. And of course, how animate is a matching hood? It's, somebody else converts the matching hood into a color. Uh, here we have a very specialized bit of English. It's from a catalog where you describe things. And Marianne Hoon found this construction particularly in the, in the catalog. So, it's, the, it's an extreme permissive subject. It's a matching hood that is going to be the subject of this, this verb convert. So one way of English to get around the loss of all these adverbials in first position as linkers is to have to turn them into subjects. There are also pretty weird passives which you don't have in Dutch and German or in Old English, but which come up around about 1500, which is exactly that same period when we find all these other things going on. We have a whole load of names here. Sir William Butlin, John Hemming, also Peterson. All these people are probably seldom identified as Canadians. Many of them are generally assumed to be Americans. In earlier times, you, you, you might have had something like this. About these, one assumes. Or about, about these, it is assumed. So you would have the link as an adverbial. But here we have the link as a subject in a very interesting passive construction that's quite new. That's quite a recent addition to um, English syntax. I'm now going to talk about something completely different and I'm even going to uh, give you some German. Because while we were doing this, uh, we embarked on a project to, have a, to get um, into this whole business of the loss of these demonstratives the loss of these, or the decline of these at verbs in first position, and the rise of these permissive subjects and strange passives, we had a colleague in Nijmegen who alerted us to this particular uh, phenomenon. There's um, uh, a lot of psycholinguistic uh, research being done in Heidelberg at the time about people, uh, English speakers and German speakers, looking at the same videos or the same pictures and then having to say what they see. And they make different choices about what they describe and how they do it. So for this sort of uh, picture, uh, typically Germans would have this, the, the, the protagonist, the, the subject, and they would have the waves there. And then they would, for the next event, they would have done, which is then, or toen in Dutch, and they, the little man would be the subject, would remain the subject here. 
what you have is a number of sub-events, so the surfing and then the next event that the, the wind blows them off the board. And each sub-event is very neatly it's in its own compartment. It's closed off with these little uh, attributing items in first position, and then the, the protagonist will be the subject in this, in, in this position here. Right? And here again, of course, we have verb second here. This is the finite verb. So this is how they're using that first position. They're using it to close off these, these sub-events. In English, what people tend to do when they have to describe this is they use a progressive. They don't need to mention the waves. That's totally optional. Well, the whole thing, of course, is optional, but what they do is this. And then they won't keep that young man a subject. They'll have the wind a subject. So they'll change the subject to the wind. It's, of course, perfectly grammatical to do the same thing in German, but the speakers don't do it. They, they do this sort of thing. So, and that's the difficulty. It's, it might be grammatical, but people don't do it. It's very difficult to, uh, uh, to research this. Because you have progressives in English, you don't have them in German, progressive allow people to have this sort of structure. You can start a sub-event. It will be open-ended. It's still going on when the next sub-event starts. You don't have to close them off. And um, Carol von Stutterheimer Nusser called this bounded. It's a topology. Some languages are bounded and others are unbounded. And I was particularly interested in the fact that this was closed off by having a verb second syntax. Uh, it's whole, the whole thing goes much further. These are eye tracker studies uh, of German and English subjects. Again, they're watching videos and have to describe them. Um, the Germans, before they start describing this motion event, the Germans are looking all over the place for a goal because they need a goal to talk about motion. And the English speakers don't need a goal. And they start talking earlier because these, they don't need to sort of scout out for a goal before they can phrase what's going on. They can just say that a couple of people are, are walking. They might be walking down the path. They don't need to walk to anywhere particular. It's, this goes so far that German and Dutch speakers too, if there's no goal in sight, they'll invent one. There's a picture in this study about a train traveling through a landscape. The English speakers have no problem saying that this, no, the train is, is, is going through a landscape or just going. The G Dutch and German speakers need to invent a station. There's no station in sight, they need to invent it. So they need these adverbial points, these places, and, um, uh, and they need these, these points in time to, to close and open their sub-events. They have no progressives. Dutch is interesting because it has a, it's, it's, it's acquiring a progressive of source, but um, that's another matter. I've done a couple of um, uh, studies of uh, another, an, anima an animation, again, where people can, you can have speakers of different languages tell, tell you what they see, and there are very interesting things to find out about that first position. Um, okay, sub-event one, the, this is about a little clay animation figure who is, uh, in the course of a 10-minute film, attacked by various outside forces. Here he falls, he, 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 he falls down and he falls onto some sort of grid. He looks through and he sees water flowing below. What do the Dutch speakers do? And by now I've got a corpus of about 50 speakers. Uh, they, they tend to have that grid mentioned more than once. So it's, it's, the grid is in view, they mention it. Then you have the sub-event where the character is looking through the grid and they mention it again through that grid. So they put it in first position. Uh, it's got this demonstrative, so it's, it's, and the whole thing through that grid, it's, it's linking back to, what, to the previous discourse. So they mention it again. The English speakers don't do it. They mention the grid. Once they've mentioned it, they can just say, uh, he looks down below. There's nothing like the through the grid. There is one speaker who says it's here, puts it here in the in final place, below through the grid. And again, this is our adverbial position in the verb second syntax. So I'm, I was really wondering whether uh, Old English might be the same sort of thing. Uh, again, same thing, instruments. Uh, Dutch speakers, at one stage, the, the character has, a, has identified a, a rock, and he's using the rock as an instrument to bang a hole in uh, a couple of other rocks. This is the rock that the character has picked up, and then the next sentence, with it, with that. 
that's not what the, the English speakers do at all. Once the rock's there, it's there implicitly uh, in, the, in the other sub-events. You start beating this rock. You, know? you don't have to, meet, to mention the instrument again. You start trying to break this rock open. Right? You, you've mentioned the rock once, you don't need to mention it again. It might be that they don't have this position to mention it. Dutch and German have this position, they have this adverbial linking position, and they will bloody well use it. So, you know, it's... So, of course, Dutch is different from Old English. Old English is different from Dutch in that we have... Dutch doesn't do this thing with the um, uh, phenomenal subject. Dutch has completely generalized, possibly, the uh, position for the finite verb as number two. But in other respects, we have that same thing. We have a, an adverbial as a linker, and we have um, some sort of uh, position for, a, for all the information here. I call this the protagonist. This is our, the main character of, of events. Um, we, or because there is a specific linking position, we can reserve the subject for the protagonist. And that means that what's going on in the history of English is that English has lost this position. It has lost this thing as a marker of uh, old information versus new. They particularly have lost the adverbial in first position as a sort of unmarked way to start a sentence. So old English and Dutch have separate slots for discourse linking and a protagonist. Right? They have the adverbial slot here, and they have the protagonist here as a subject. Present day English has really one slot for discourse linking. This ends our program. Um, for the protagonist, the young man who is surfing, but also for non-protagonists, because we had that switch with the wind. Right? The young man is surfing, the wind <coughs> blows him off the board, where the German and Dutch speakers don't mention the wind. They just stick their, they, 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 use their sub, they use their supposition for protagonists. They stick with the protagonists. They don't mention the wind. This gives you a couple of predictions. So if Old English is really in this particular uh, instance like Dutch and German, and if the subject is not reserved in Old English for the protagonist, uh, sorry, if the subject in Modern English is not reserved for the protagonist as it used to be in earlier times, but non-protagonist and discourse links intervene, they can also be subject, you would need uh, the protagonist to be reactivated more often because you're talking about John, and then John becomes he in the next sentence. Then maybe the wind intervenes, or a discourse link intervenes. This ends our program. And if you want to talk about John again, you have to reactivate him. You can't say he, you have to say John. So that gives some sort of uh, hypothesis that you could test in, in corpora. So you would expect differences in the ratios of proper names, oppositions like his mother, uh, pronouns and subjects that are completely left out. If you um, reserve your subject for your protagonist, as in Dutch and German, if Old English does that too, if you reserve it, you can actually leave it out for your next verb because an elliptic subject will be your protagonist. Right? So you, have, you should have more elliptic subjects. That's also what the Heidelberg uh, psycholinguists found. So elliptic subjects are also a part of this mix. There should be more subject switch. Your subject should not just be protagonist, but there could be discourse links, non-protagonist. You should have more switching between <coughs> subjects. And we, of course, would expect to find more non-protagonists as subjects in present-day English and in Old English. We have no Old English speakers. We have to deduce these things in other ways. You can go to Corpor again and look for subject ellipsis. The Corpus uh, goes all the way from Old English to Middle English, to Early Modern English, to Modern English. It's syntactically coded, it's morphologically coded. It's, you can actually get these uh, elliptic <coughs> subjects out uh, very quickly. And you do see that they decline as time goes on. But uh, it's very difficult to say anything about these other hypotheses. In Nijmegen, we, as part of the project, uh, again with the help of Erwin, completely indispensable, uh, we've started to um, add some other information to these uh, historical corpora. They already have all this other information about syntax. We code them also with reference. So any personal pronoun or noun phrase, if it refers to anything in the previous discourse, that will be coded. 
So you can actually tr uh, track a uh, chains of protagonists through the text. This is all uh, a bit preliminary, but if you are going to build this change, you sort of you look at all the subjects and you see what they refer back to. You will, of course, have um, you will expect to have long chains for the protagonists, so they'll be they'll be, tend to be subjects, and you'll have lots of pronouns, and every now and again it's reactivated to John or to his son or whatever, and then you go back to he. But you have these long chains for um, Things like this ends our program, you would expect short change. Just this and whatever it refers back to. For non-protagonists like the wind, the wind blows them off the board, again, you would expect short change. So you could look at the sort of change that are built in these discourses. We only look at narrative text because genre is, of course, totally throwing this whole thing, of course. You, we need to have the text as similar as possible. And even here, some of the narrative texts are first-person singular narration. Also, it's very, very dodgy. So these are very preliminary results. But you do see that there are differences in, in the numbers of chains. And protagonist ellipses, uh, rates of subject switch, and long and short chains. Right? So we do get more short chains building on subjects as time goes on. We also have a rise of inanimate subjects. If you have the wind coming in as a, a possible subject, the wind is inanimate, right? So you have fewer, it's the, the subject is not reserved to your protagonist. It can also be the wind, and it can be a discourse link. This ends our program. So we get more inanimate subjects, and that's, it's still very preliminary. It's not a, any sort of massive difference between Old English and Late Modern English, but it's certainly worth uh, investigating further. And there are my references. I've managed to stay just within an hour. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.